Hello, I'm Bruce Grady, and you are Robin Lim. You are running the Yayasan Bumi Sehat, which is a uh, birthing clinic in Indonesia, and have saved hundreds of lives and have delivered thousands and thousands of babies over the year. The main thing I'm interested in is um, how you have uh, begin to not cut and clamp the cord early, and you're saying that a lot of nutrients keep going to the baby for the first two hours at least. Um, stem cells, antibodies, and the child becomes much more healthy than compared to cutting the cord early. I wish you would tell me about wisdom birthing, which involves not cutting the umbilical cord early in children. Now, what is it that happens, and why is it important? First of all, thank you for coining the term wisdom birth. That was a stroke of genius. Wisdom birth, for me, is more than just the moment of birth. We know that the moment of birth is is a fulcrum, and it can determine uh, whether or not a person has an intact ability to love and trust or an impaired ability to love and trust. But leading up to wisdom birth is uh, everything that happens to the parents, preconception, the actual conception, the gestation of the child, the labor, the birth, and the first hour of life, and then of course breastfeeding and nurturing and all of that, birth being that fulcrum. We also know from research and from experience that uh, the placenta is almost in a way uh, the primal mind because the placenta makes reproductive, reproductive health and, and, uh, and, and gestation and, and the miracle of birth all possible. Without uh, a placenta, the mother and baby couldn't survive. Nothing, nothing would work. Um, so, one of the things that we do is we really protect at Bumi Sehat, and myself as midwives, and many midwives in the world now, and OBGYNs are on board with this, and pediatricians, that we need to not only protect the mother and the baby at birth, but we need to protect the placenta. And we need to do that by not immediately clapping and cutting the umbilical cord. Because when you do that, you immediately deny the baby 40 to 60 percent of his or her blood supply, which is still in the placenta. The stem cells are made in the placenta, and those move into the baby last. Uh, without that full blood supply, your brain and all your organs are not ever fully innervated. So uh, there is research showing that the leading cause of marginal retardation in the world today, which means people that are functioning normally, normally, but they're not functioning at, at full capacity. Uh, the, the leading cause of that is newborn anemia, which is caused by the immediate clapping and cutting of the umbilical cord. Remember, the clapping and cutting of the umbilical cord is a sterile procedure because it's inherently dangerous. Um, and what happens the minute they clamp and cut that umbilical cord, not even the minute, the second, is they take that baby away from the mother. And, what, and that is your time of most profound learning. So for that baby, what that baby's learning in the first moment... Could we say and bonding? Well, that's, yes, exactly, exactly. In that, in that time when bonding is most important, this baby is learning separation, anxiety, fear, abandonment, and what does that come down to? I'm going to die. My, my, the blood that was coming from my placenta that was oxygenating my body and my brain that was making it so that I could actually breathe without my lungs fully, my lungs are not activated yet the heart chambers are changing in those first moments of life. The, the way that we absorb oxygen into our bloodstream was dependent on the placenta. Now that placenta has been clamped, cut, we don't get that oxygenated blood anymore. Before our lungs have, have and before our hearts made the exchange and our lungs are able to fill with air. So before that first breath, you have this incredible trauma and without words, you know that you're going to die. You feel like you're going to die. And so what you're saying, there's, there's, not a, there's actually no reason to cut the cord and every reason not to. Yes, exactly. Except Even for the World Health time Organization. expediency of, of hospitals and science. Right? Efficiency, yes. Yeah. The World Health Organization has said that the immediate clapping and cutting of the umbilical cord is a protocol that needs to be justified. So I don't see any justification. Uh, and they say, well, what if the baby's premature? Well, when the babies are premature, that's the one time that pediatricians have said, oh, absolutely, wait. 
Okay. They even milk the cord toward the baby before clamping and cutting so to make sure to push some of the blood and stem cells toward the baby. Now, the sicker the baby, the more compromised the baby is, say the baby um, is stillborn. That's the baby that definitely needs that cord left intact. Now, all babies need to, that cord to, left to intact. To segue into why uh, the most powerful thing I've heard in terms of your discussion of this is a couple of simple little stories. Would you tell your little stories, the one about the puppy and the one about the doctor? Okay. Uh, there's a project in India called the Jiva Project, and part of that research has shown that the traditional birth attendants, the dais, the midwives that don't have an education in India, but they have generations of uh, the, the spiritual authority to receive babies into the world. They have the trust of the people, and they have certain techniques that they've always used throughout time. These dais were taught CPR, infant CPR, as were all the doctors and attendants in the hospital. And they found that the dais out in the villages were having a better success rate resuscitating stillborn babies than the doctors in hospitals. So they emailed me about this. And they said when they observed why, why do these people with seemingly no education, why are they better able to resuscitate stillborn babies than doctors who have oxygen and you know all kinds of things that, you know, modern hospital at their disposal. And they found the difference was is that the dyes did not cut and clamp, clamp and cut that umbilical cord. So while they were doing CPR, the placenta is still able to give oxygenated blood to the baby. And the other thing they did is once the placenta was born, still left attached to the baby, they would either put the placenta in warm water to stimulate it and or massage that placenta while resuscitating the baby. And they found that this placenta when you stimulate it, was able to help the stillborn baby to live. And so you found by experience that this might be true. What was your first indication of that? So I get this email, and uh, it's early, early morning, dawn, and I come downstairs, and my dog is in labor. And I get called away to the clinic, the Bumi Sahak clinic, because there's five women in labor, and the midwives really need me there to help. So I come home around lunchtime. We've had five babies at the clinic, and we've had nine puppies at home. And my son is really upset because the dog has had one stillborn puppy, and he had wrapped the puppy, he and my granddaughter wrapped the puppy in white cloth, which is very traditional in Bali, and they put the puppy aside up on a little table. But the mother dog just kept going and getting this dead puppy. And what my granddaughter and my son wanted her to do was focus on the eight living puppies. She wanted that dead puppy. So I said, leave her alone. She knows what she's doing. So she licked that puppy a little bit, but now all the puppies are still attached to their placentas. So. She puts the puppy under her chin and she starts to lick the placenta. And she licks the placenta for about two and a half hours. And she lifts up her chin and she shows me a living puppy. Wow. So it was pretty astonishing for me. Later that night, we had a stillborn baby at the clinic. I was called down. The midwives were doing CPR. Things were going slowly. The baby's placenta was born. A nurse immediately put that placenta in hot water, put on a glove, and started massaging that placenta. I had taken over CPR. and. That's when the baby's heartbeat started up again. But the baby wasn't breathing on his own yet. And I looked and I saw in the corner of the room, the grandfather, who happened to be a Hindu priest, was standing there. And I asked him if he had some holy water. And he said, of course. Everybody in Bali who's a priest or a priestess carries a little plastic bag with holy water that they call Tirtha in it. He gets out his little plastic bag from his pocket. He opens it up. He says, what should I do with it? And I'm doing CPR. He said, put on the placenta. And he pours it on the placenta. And the baby takes a deep breath and cries. So twice in one day, I had the experience of seeing how stimulating the placenta can work. And then, so further on in the, in the ensuing days, you have used this technique not with holy water, but just in terms of keeping the placenta in. holy water. <laughs> well, maybe, but, uh, but you probably attribute, I'm going to guess that you attribute a lot of the success of this simply to not cutting the cord yes. and massaging the placenta. Uh -huh. right? And has have the, any of the doctors in the hospitals accepted what you're saying? Yes, and we, routine, we routinely use that technique that um, comes from India that's very traditional. Uh, the one doctor who, uh, now I have, I have friends three in particular, but five doctors who are surgeons, obstetrical surgeons, if we need to transport a woman from Bumi Sehat for an emergency cesarean, there are five doctors who, if we ask them not to clap and cut the umbilical cord, will still deliver the baby completely intact. Even a cesarean birth, you can have a lotus birth, which means, lotus to me means 
or wisdom birth, as we like to call it, it means that you see the root, and you see the stem, and you see the fruit, which is the baby. You see it all. It's a, it's a very, and once the mother and father bond to the baby intact with the placenta, mm -hmm. you start to see it's a real miraculous, uh, holistic, uh, beautiful thing. And uh, so we now, also Did the doctors sing, think you were crazy? Oh, yes. So I, I came into surgery with a couple who had planned not to cut their baby's umbilical cord, but they really, they really needed, the mother and baby really needed a cesarean birth. And it was pretty much an emergency. I called ahead. We, we transported. We ran into surgery. While we're running into surgery, I said to Dr. Haryasa, I don't want to cut the cord. The, the family doesn't want it. It's their, tra it's their tradition. It's what they really want. And he said, are you crazy? I said, yeah, you know I'm crazy. Of course. Yes, I'm crazy. And he said, well, there's no reason to cut the cord. Okay. I'm going to let this happen. And of course, then when, we, when, we're, when I had the baby in the cord and the placenta, the pediatrician was almost in tears because she had been taught a myth. And, the, and it, was, it was an erroneous myth that the baby would die if we didn't clap and cut the cord. And I said to her, I promise you, and this baby was quite compromised. This baby was blue, and I was doing CPR on the baby. And the pediatrician arrived, and she just let me do CPR because I was doing it fine. And she said, I really want to clamp and cut that cord. It's going to be better. I said, no, it's not. Do not touch it. And I said, I'm, I'm asking you. And um, she was so afraid. And when she saw that the baby actually did better than any baby she's seen in that condition, I mean, the baby was as blue as your shirt. The baby did fine. And she became a believer. But the thing that happened with Dr. Hariasa is he then went and read the research. And when his own baby was born, he did not allow the umbilical cord to be, cord to be clamped and cut. Mm. That was about six months later. So he really not only uh, opened his heart to a completely foreign idea. In fact, he said, are, are you crazy? But he employed it for his own family. Not only that, is uh, during the cesarean birth and during all births, um, one of the things we as midwives do it when we say hot, and it's part of wisdom birth, is we sing to the babies as they're being born. And the mothers will also sing, and the fathers routinely sing. Mm -hmm. if, they're, if they're Hindu, we sing the Gayatri Mantra. If they're uh, Muslim, we sing the Bismillah or the Adzan. Um, there's many, many, many beautiful Christian songs to sing. Uh, there's uh, the Buddhist prayer, May All Beings Be Happy. Um, and so no matter what the family's faith is, we try to greet the child singing. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Haryasa was so moved by that that he could barely finish the cesarean operation. We had to dab his eyes because he was crying, mm -hmm. tears of joy. And his own daughter, whose cord he did not cut, he sang the Gayatri Mantra to her as she was crowning into the world. And he named her Gayatri because of that. So his he, as a family person, has... He's, he's a scientist. He's an OBGYN. He's a surgeon. But he's embraced lotus birth, and he's embraced seeing the babies into the world. He's embraced wisdom birth.